It's time! Folks, two years ago, I made a video called Barbie vs. Bratz, where I pitted two... Is it pitted? Or I pit two... Pat. Is it Pat? I made two plastic doll movies battle it out with each other, see which one was better, and you guys really liked it. So the year after, I made Barbie vs. Bratz 2, and you guys really liked that one as well. If you didn't see that one, I ended Barbie vs. Bratz 2 with this. I'll just have to wait for the live-action Barbie movie to come out. So I can hit that one against the, the live-action Bratz move. That'll, that'll be the finale. It was a long wait, and I apologize for that. I wanted to make this video sooner, but the SAG after strike was going on, and I didn't know the rules of stuff, and I didn't want to talk about it, you know, in solidarity. But a few weeks ago, sag after did their best impression of a guy closing down a bowling alley and said, no more strike. So the time has come to finally finish the Barbie vs. Bratz trilogy on my channel. It's time for Barbie vs. Bratz live action. And if you don't know, the score is all tied up after the first two videos. So whoever wins this one takes the cake. All right, enough yapping. Let's get into it. First up, the live action Bratz movie. The live action Bratz movie released in 2007 in order to capitalize on the popularity of the dolls and the animated films. It was not received well by critics or anyone really it did somehow score five award nominations though so that's pretty good it was up for worst picture worst actress worst supporting actor worst screen couple and worst remake or ripoff they fortunately lost all of these awards to the film i know who killed me starring Lindsay lohan which sounds insane from what i've read so freaking subscribe if you want me to talk about that movie do it right now. The live action Bratz movie acts as sort of like an origin story of the Bratz, and it follows Sasha, Yasmin, Jade, and Chloe as they try to navigate their first few years of high school. This had a full on theatrical release and the people behind it had like a lot of faith in this movie. The actors were already mentioning a sequel that was in the works during their press tour. Well, Bratz 2 yeah, is Bratz in the works. Works. There's gonna be a Bratz 2. Like, so yeah. they're writing it right now. Due to the film's lackluster performance at the box office, that sequel never came to fruition. But I'll let you be the judge on whether or not this movie deserves a sequel. So the movie starts with the Bratz FaceTiming each other while they're all getting ready for their first day of high school. And yeah, viewers of my channel will recognize the actor who plays Chloe. She also plays Kylie in every single Baby Geniuses movie. I can't escape those fucking movies, man. And her godfather in real life is John Voight. So, fingers crossed, I really hope he isn't in this movie either. And oh my god damn it, of course. And in Comic Sans, nonetheless. Ugh, kick me while I'm down. This is where we learn a little bit more about each brat's life. I should say really quick, they don't refer to themselves as brats. Well, it, later it kind of happens, but just know that when I'm referring to them as brats, they don't really do that yet. Or, okay, you'll see you later. So the first brat, Yasmin. We meet her little brother who's obsessed with his looks, and then we meet the rest of her family. And according to the brat's wiki, Yasmin is <laughs> alive. So that's, that's good, I guess. Why do they have to put that? Are there dead ones? He's super fucked up. Yeah, I bought a Brad's doll, but he fucking died. But the wiki also says that Yasmin is Hispanic. So let's see how the movie portrays that aspect of her character. Buenos dias! Now, I don't know if you caught that. It was pretty subtle. But she said buenos dias. You know, you sort of got to read between the lines with this sort of stuff. Cards on the table. I'm not Hispanic, but if, you know, if you are, please leave a comment. Let me know <laughs> if this is accurate. Let me know if there's a fucking mariachi band at your breakfast table every morning. I don't know. We then meet Sasha. She comes from a wealthy family, but her parents are divorced. Why can't the two of you just talk to each other? I'm the kid. You're supposed to be the adult. We then cut to Jade. Her parents are really strict about what she wears, and they're really pushy about her academics and extracurricular activities. And then we meet Chloe. Her family life isn't really revealed until later in the movie, but she lives with her single mom, and I guess they don't have too much money. And also, she's a friggin' klutz. <laughs> Jesus Christ, no wonder her dad left. So the brats all arrive at their first day of high school. But this is no ordinary high school. It's uh, an exaggerated depiction of high school with like really strict messaging everywhere like Obey all school signage! Or you'll be like killed by an axe, I guess? Order! Obey! Submit! And it seems pretty brutal for a high school to have all these signs. Like, this is what cops say. Order! Obey! Submit! 
Put the gun down. Okay, well, actually, that that last one actually kind of makes sense for a, a high school in America. So the girls all form a huddle while Jade changes into her cool fashion look that her parents wouldn't approve of. And then they all talk about all the cool stuff that they're going to do in high school. I'm going to own cheerleading. I'm going to try out for soccer. You have to join chorus. You know you have the most insane voice ever. Not a chance. Okay, cool. So they're like a diverse friend group and they all have different like hobbies, passions and stuff, which is bad news for the antagonist of the film, Meredith. She's the student body president at the school and she keeps everything meticulously organized by clicks. And like, yeah, sure, that happens at high schools, but like, dude, this high school has the weirdest, most specific clicks ever. There are 48 distinct clicks. You have the goths, the skaters, the uh, disco dorks, the b-boy blingers, the gangsters, the wannabe gangsters, the pretzel people who are into yoga. I paused the movie on where they have like the seating diagram of all the clicks and let's just take a look at some of them. Headgear? You're separating people by how crooked their teeth are? Also, headgear isn't like a, like a hobby. And also, why are the cheerleaders beside the gamer geeks? Disco dorks, dino students, what the fuck are those? You dinosaurs at your high school? And also, yo, mimes? There's enough mimes at your high school to warrant an entire table? I fucking doubt it, dude. My high school had over a thousand kids in it, not one single mime. Okay, they were all married. It's either that or I just didn't notice them because they were so quiet. So Meredith's dad is the principal and he's played by John Voigt. Yes, daddy, what is it? Which is how she gets away with running the high school like a prison. You were right. Control the population. A, separate the inmates into groups. But like, you can just leave school whenever you want. You could just walk out. So I don't really think like the prison methods apply. It's not like you can just drop out of prison if you don't want to go. Unless you're a politician. That was an intelligent joke. Oh my God. So the arrival of the Bratz is pretty jarring to everybody because they all belong to different cliques, but, you know, they're still hanging out with each other. Which I get the message they're trying to go for, but you're telling me this is the first time a group of friends liked different shit? I find that hard to believe. And if you can just choose what clique you're going to go into the first day, I'd be like, okay, I'm going to be a popular kid. How about that? I'm popular. Put me with them. I'm popular. And also... I'll say it. I'm about to say it. If this is a Bratz movie, make the characters look like Bratz. Give them fucking huge heads, big creepy ass eyeballs, dude. Them showing up and like the entire school being confused, that would make way more sense if they look like that. Whoa, is that the new guy? Yeah, that's him. He's so cool. Hey guys, sorry, my head is so heavy. So all the girls start going to their classes. But this is where we meet Jade's love interest, Dexter, played by none other than a young Chet Hanks. Big up the whole island massive, it's your boy Chet and I, coming straight from the Golden Globe. This was filmed before he converted to Jamaican. But it's still pretty cool to see what Chet Hanks is up to when it isn't the white boy summertime. Good boy, it's a white boy summer. There's then a montage of all the girls excelling in their extracurricular activities, featuring amazing dialogue written by an adult pretending to be a teenager. So bring it. Girl, I brought it, nailed it, lent it to my friend's kid sister, and I brought it back while you were still figuring out the beat. How do you do, fellow kids? <laughs> Sasha is cheerleading, Jade is doing some cool science stuff, and Chloe is playing soccer. And dude, even the sports messaging is unnecessarily threatening. Win at all costs. I don't think you should be telling that to students who are treated like prisoners. Imagine she's just fucking shanking people as she runs. That's what shanking looks like. We then cut to Yasmin. She's supposed to be the singer of the group, but she has crippling stage fright. Also, just realize the term crippling stage fright is pretty dramatic. Yo, dude, you can't park there. That's a handicap spot. Okay, bro, ever heard of an invisible illness? I have stage fright. Okay, now if you'll excuse me, I have a doctor's appointment. <laughs> Hate to be the one to tell you this, but you have stage four cancer. Mm -hmm. Stage? Okay, this next part is super weird. So Yasmin like runs away from band practice because of her stage fright and bumps into this guy named Dylan. And I'll just let this scene play for you guys. Honey, what's where you're going? Are you blind? Hello? No, but I'm deaf. What? I'm deaf. You don't sound deaf. Oh! Well, you don't look ignorant, but I guess you can't judge a book, right? <laughs> okay, first off, she looks 
genuinely petrified that she just encountered a deaf guy. <laughs> also, what an absolutely out-of-pocket thing to say to someone. You don't sound deaf. Wild. <laughs> you don't look blind. The brats go for lunch and are confronted by Meredith about sitting together. Buy the seating charts right here. But they hold strong in their commitment to their friendship together. Thanks, but I think we'd rather sit together. And then one minute later, they immediately throw all of that out the window. Check out this radical theorem. You'll absolutely dig it. Yo, Chloe! Girl, come check this out! What the fuck? Hey, listen. We're gonna be friends forever. Okay, no one is gonna tear us apart. I'm with you to the very end. Through thick and thin. I'm not going hey, anywhere. Curtis, come sit with us! Alright, see you later. And then the other annoying part is immediately after they're all, like, split up and shit. They're all, like, sad about it. They're all just, like, frowning at each other. Guys, if this is making you sad, don't do it. Just fucking sit with each other. What's the big deal? But anyways, there's a small montage of the friend group slowly starting to drift apart because they're also busy with their school activities. But like, they're lifelong best friends, so I assume this will blow over in just a couple weeks. Two years! Yeah, they stopped talking for two Two years because they didn't eat lunch together once. Hey guys, sorry to break it to you, but I don't think you guys are really that close of friends if all it took was one lunch apart from each other for your entire group to crumble. So all the girls are now stuck in their respective cliques, except for Yasmin. She's she's kind of a loner now, probably because people found out how mean she was to that deaf guy. <laughs> We got to a school assembly, and Meredith announces there will be a talent show in a few weeks, and the grand prize is a scholarship to the school of their choice. Isn't that amazing? Also, correct me if I'm wrong, because my high school didn't have any, like, class president, or maybe it did, I just wasn't paying attention, but I thought the student body president had to be a senior. If Meredith was the senior president two years ago, and is still the senior president now, I think she might be a little old to be the president, right? <laughs> But hey, this does take place in America. That was an intelligent joke. We now cut back to Dylan. He's playing the piano in the music room, but gets frustrated because he can't hear very well. I don't know if you picked up on that. Pretty subtle. I'm deaf. And this is when the music teacher walks in. Dylan, you've been holding out on me. Huh? All this time, I thought you were just some cool jock. <laughs> okay, dude. All this time, I thought you were just some cool, swagged out jock. <laughs> Turns out you're goaded as well. So they have this big emotional discussion about Dylan missing music because he's deaf. I don't know if you know that. It's pretty subtle. What are you talking about? I can't hear. And then it cuts to the music teacher teaching Dylan how to like spin records while holding his hand to the speaker so he can feel the music. Beethoven style. And look, it is super cool that they tried to add a character like this and tried to tell a story that often doesn't get told in movies like this, especially back in 2007. But like, if you're gonna give us a deaf character, fucking give us a deaf character. And obviously deafness, it's obviously on a spectrum like everything else. But the thing that just kind of bugs me is like this character's entire arc revolves around him being deaf. What are you talking about? I can't hear. While also being able to read lips perfectly, which is like almost impossible to do. And he's also able to easily communicate with everybody around him with zero issues ever. You wanna learn a few tricks? Yeah. That doesn't give us anything like interesting. He's just another character who's like, oh yeah, but also I'm deaf. Like I would have loved to see an actual deaf actor portray this dude who like needs to use sign language to communicate. That would have been awesome to see. I don't know, I feel like everything in this movie is just done halfway. Even with the main characters. A common criticism I've seen about this movie is that all the main Bratz characters have been whitewashed from their original character designs. So for sure, they whitewashed the heck out of Yasmin, in my opinion. I mean, they whitewashed all of the girls quite a bit, but Yasmin for sure. The beauty in the Bratz dolls is that they were so diverse. They tried to represent every race and background as best as they could. You had a black Bratz doll, you had a Hispanic, an Asian, and a white one. Like the Jade character in the Bratz universe is Asian, but they made her half Asian in the movie. Yasmin is whitewashed as well in this movie, but I guess it's okay because the mariachi band. Buenos dias. And I've even seen criticism about Sasha's portrayal. Sasha is dark skinned. Y'all see her? That is dark skin, okay? Not only was Sasha played by a light skinned woman, she was played by a biracial woman. Me and many other black girls growing up, we love Sasha. We love the fact that Sasha was dark skinned. We love seeing a dark skinned girl 
be confident in who she was. And she owned it, okay? Like this movie had such a cool, unique opportunity to tell a bunch of interesting stories, but it just never even tried to do any of that, which is frustrating, but I digress. Okay guys, this next scene is pretty crazy. Meredith's dog makes Chloe spill her lunch on Jade, which causes her to spill on Sasha, which causes Sasha to spill on Yasmin. And look, I've seen enough teen movies to know where this is going. <laughs> Yeah! If they were really running this school like a prison, the guards would be out here smacking these kids silly, dude. They'd be pepper spraying them and shit. Step your game up, Meredith. And also, why is she so happy in this scene? Her character's entire identity hinges on the school being controlled and organized. This is the opposite of what she would want. Also, fuck, sorry, I forgot. There's, there's one line before the food fight that's like my favorite line of the whole film. Sasha, you stupid cheerleader! You did not just say that! How dare thee call me a wizard! So the brats get blamed for the food fight. I want to know who did this. And they get sentenced to death. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Detention. Detention. They get detention. And yo, Chloe is absolutely posing back there. <laughs> Holy shit, relax. They told her she had to serve time. All she heard was serve. So they all start arguing and then Sasha hits Chloe with the fucking chirp of the century. Really? What are you talking about, Sasha? At least we don't buy our friends with our daddy's bank account. Only because you don't have a dad or a bank account. Yeah, that'll stop you from posing real quick. <laughs> so they all end up talking again and reminiscing about their old friendship. We can be friends with each other and do our own thing, right? Okay. How? Jesus Christ, guys. BFFs! Okay, so that's all it took. Fucking one conversation with each other and you guys are friends again. <laughs> Which is great for them, but like if I was Chloe, I'd be like, yo, Sasha, fuck you. I'm not your friend. You just had the meanest thing ever. <laughs> Anyways, the brats are back and Meredith is not happy about that. And those bin bets wouldn't be in detention and back together creating anarchy in my kingdom. Back at Yasmin's house, she's singing La Cucaracha with her mom because again, I don't know if you could tell, but her family's Hispanic. La Cucaracha! While this is going on, Yasmin's little brother records her singing with her mom because the most embarrassing thing you could do as a teenager is share a genuine loving moment with one of your parents. We then cut to the brats at the mall because they're buddies again and this is when dylan walks by and they all freak out he totally just checked you out did you see that he's into you what? what dylan are you kidding me he's totally not my type yeah i think we know he's not your type yasmin <laughs> We then cut to a hilarious scene of the brats eating together during lunch and all their respective cliques beckoning them over to eat with them. And I know this is an exaggeration of high school and cliques, but it's so funny to imagine a soccer team wearing their jerseys all day, every day, and just standing around holding soccer balls in their hand and just tossing them up and down. Like that's the one thing you're not allowed to do with soccer balls. <laughs> Yo, Clyde, come do it. Soccer. She's on the soccer team. Then we get a pretty cool scene with Chet Hanks. You gonna cry? <laughs> Hi -ya! You're Jamaican me crazy! We gonna tune in! Alright, this next scene is super weird. The plot is thickening though. So Yasmin's little brother shows up to Meredith's house because her little sister forgot her ballet shoes at dance class. So you'd assume he would be there to return those shoes, right? Yo, Cherish, you left your shoes at ballet class. But he doesn't have any shoes with him. Went all the way there to just tell her that she forgot her shoes. That is psycho behavior, dude. <laughs> Hi, sorry, NYPD. I've got good news for you. We found your son. Oh my god, is... Please, is... Is he okay? Oh yeah, he's fine. We found him at a Walmart about an hour away from here. Oh, thank god. I was worried sick. I can imagine. All right, see you later. Bye. Okay, back to the movie, sorry. Yasmin's little brother shows Meredith the embarrassing video of Yasmin and her mother singing together and uploads it onto a USB stick for Meredith to keep. I'm gonna try to speed through the rest of this fucking movie because we still have a whole other movie to talk about. So here we go. We cut to a scene with Yasmin singing in the music room when Dylan walks up. Also really quick before I show you this clip. So this actor isn't deaf and he's doing like a voice to like sound like a deaf guy. And the voice that he landed on is pretty wild. I don't know what he was going for, but it kind of sounds like he's like inhaling helium. Didn't exactly hear your voice. I felt your voice. Yeah, super weird. Your singing's amazing. Seriously? I understand. I mean, I can't hear, but I heard you. Okay. Here, here. Sing something. 
open eyes. I can see what's in front of me. So that's how you heard me? Okay. Sorry to nitpick here, but if you're singing with the microphone that close to the speaker, <laughs> there's gonna be so much fucking feedback. <laughs> Boy, your voice feels so strong. How are you hitting that note for so long? <laughs> I'm bleeding. We then cut to Meredith's birthday party where she is singing a song called Fabulous. I'm fabulous. Sound familiar? I'm fabulous. Dude, I can't imagine what it was like for the producers of this movie to put out a film for teens that features a song called Fabulous on August 3rd, 2007. And then exactly 14 days later, High School Musical 2, the film for teens, is released featuring a song called Fabulous and absolutely blew it out of the water in terms of popularity and cultural relevance. <laughs> Troy, what do you think about the Bratz movie? It's no good at all. Meredith plays the video of Yasmin and her mom and it kind of backfires because nobody really gives a shit. And honestly, this whole party scene really did not need to happen in the movie. But one kind of important thing happens at the end of the party. <laughs> She said, it. she said the name of the movie. Yeah, did they ever do that in High School Musical 2? I don't think so. So what are we, some sort of High School Musical 2? Okay, sorry for showing my cards a little early here, but this movie fucking sucks. The structure and pacing is so weird. They had this whole like triumphant moment at Meredith's party and things were looking up for the brats and all the other students at the high school, like rebelling against the idea of, of clicks. And it's like a really empowering moment for everybody. But when they go back to school the next day, it's like nothing happened. Wow. She's brought back clicks. What the fuck? How? You either need to spend more time with us, or we need to cut you from the roster. Come on, Chet. It's pronounced Rasta. Oh, Hit it with that hard R, bro. Rasta. <laughs> okay, sorry. We're almost at the end, I promise. The Bratz and Dylan devise a plan to save the school, and this is how they're gonna do it. They are gonna enter the talent show. Wow. The only way to get everyone back together is to win the talent show. It's genius. Bratz! Yeah! <laughs> Bro thinks he's part of the team. A lot of pointless bullshit happens after this, so I'm just gonna jump right to the talent show. Meredith sings another song with some timeless lyrics. M -m 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 I, say, I have 10 million friends. And then the brats walk in and demand to perform when Meredith shows the school all the brats' deepest, darkest secrets. Like how Jade dresses in all black clothing when she comes to school, or how Chloe's mom used to be a maid for Meredith's family. Exhibit B, all-American girl, the perfect daughter. When her mother desperately needed a job, my family was kind enough to offer her employment as our maid. Just the worst fucking shit, dude. Unforgivable crap. But somehow, everybody accepts their super fucked up dark secrets, and they let the brats perform. Meredith, this one's for you. And this part is confusing to me because Yasmin was the sole singer of the group. But out of nowhere, Jade has like a beautiful singing voice. There ain't no difference who you are, no, it's no but. Oh yeah, and also Sasha and Chloe as well. Just follow early, be fearless, oh, ta, 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 ta. Poor Yasmin. She's had no click at all for like the whole film. The only thing she had was a good singing voice. Could you imagine after all that, finding out that your multi-talented friends can also sing just as well as you? I'd be so fucking pissed. The brats kiss the cheeks of the guys they like, except for Sasha. She doesn't get a boyfriend. They win the scholarship and give it to Chloe because she doesn't have any money. And then they're asked by MTV to perform at their next red carpet premiere. Hey, we're having a movie premiere next Saturday night. How would you girls like to be the featured act on the red carpet? <gasps> And that's the live-action Bratz movie, pretty much. The only other thing that happens is there's a sad music video from the actor who plays Jade during the credits for some reason. In conclusion, I feel like the live-action Bratz movie didn't really have anything to do with the Bratz dolls and overall lore. Like, the animated Bratz movies feature the Bratz traveling the world and getting into crazy, unbelievable situations. And I think that would have been cool to see in live-action. But in reality, this movie could have just been called Clicks. Like, I feel like they just already had this script and grab the Bratz name just to, like, get people to watch it, you know? So I think I'm going to give the live-action Bratz movie a 5 out of 10. All right, now it's time to watch the friggin' shitty-ass live-action Barbie movie. Shit. Okay, we've got a problem. I think you all know who would win. 
between the cheesy live action Bratz movie released in 2007 and the brand new Barbie movie featuring Margot Robbie and Ryan Gosling and was also directed by Greta Gerwig. Bratz doesn't stand a chance, dude. And what would I even say about the Barbie movie? Ugh, it's good. The only thing I could make fun of is like the blatant Chevrolet product placement in the Barbie movie. But even that's not a big deal. You know, you gotta fund your production somehow, right? And that reminds me. Let's hear a word from today's sponsor. This video is sponsored by the Pokemon Company International. Yeah, you heard me, dude. That's right. This is literally a friggin' dream come true. This video is sponsored by the Pokemon Company International. Folks, it's that time of year, and Pokemon Unite is bringing you to a winter wonderland. Do not miss your chance to snag the one and only Meowskarada for free, engage in a frosty battle in the limited time game mode, and also unwrap your free daily gifts, dude. I've been having so much fun playing Pokemon Unite, and I cannot wait to play with Meowskarada because there's so many possibilities with its myriad of playstyles and different combos. And just take a look at these animations. I mean, come on, dude. Are you kidding me? Incredible. If you're down for some festive fun and a little bit of a challenge as well, give the Snowball Battle Game Mode a try. If your Pokemon's HP drops to zero, you'll transform into a snowman right on the spot. Gather lights by playing and unlock some sugar plum holiday rewards by lighting up the Aos tree. And that sounds like a lot, but that's not it. There's so much more holiday fun Pokemon Unite has in store. Tons of holiday events and gifts are happening in the game, like the daily free prize machine ball throws that guarantee a Holloware reward. So click the link below to get Unite today, which is free to start, by the way, on iOS, Android, and Nintendo Switch. And join in on all the holiday fun Pokemon Unite has to offer. And don't forget to leave a comment if you spot me in a match. Thanks again to the Pokemon Company International for sponsoring this video. Again, click the link in my description and get Unite today which is free to start on ios android and nintendo switch happy holidays folks and i'll see you on pokemon unite yeah it would be unfair for me to pit these two movies against each other so i'm not going to luckily there is another live action barbie movie that we can talk about instead not a lot of people know about it it was released in the year 2000 it doesn't explicitly use the barbie name but also the Bratz movie didn't really use the Bratz name either, so I feel like it's, it's pretty fair. The original live-action Barbie movie is called Life Size, starring Tyra Banks and the 2007 award show sweeper from earlier in the video, Lindsay Lohan. This movie is about a little girl's doll that comes to life and <laughs> hilarity ensues. So let's see if this unofficial live-action Barbie movie can beat the live-action Bratz movie. The movie starts with a commercial for a doll named Eve. She lives in the fictional American town called Sunnyvale, and she's had every career imaginable. So this is very clearly a parody of Barbie dolls. Like the song says... Be a star. We then cut to the real world, and we get a hilarious line from a little girl looking at an Eve doll through a window. How about one of those? No way. I don't want a doll. I want something with microchips. Girls and their microchips. Jeez Louise, when will it end? You hear that, parents? If you got a daughter, don't get her a Barbie doll. Get her an industrial-sized fax machine. I want something with microchips. Fax. I don't get it, Sam. Used to be we couldn't keep dolls on the shelf. Now all those kids want is high-tech this, high-tech that. It is really funny that this was an issue back in 2000 when the most high-tech laptop looked like that. <laughs> if this lady time traveled to the future and saw an iPad baby in action, dude, the fucking head would explode. <laughs> we then cut to a football game, and this is when we meet the main character, Casey, played by Lindsay Lohan. And she's not like most girls. She plays football and hates dolls. I don't like wiener head. I hate dolls as much as I hate you. And microchips. Casey is looking for her dad, Ben, in the stands. But he's not there. He's at the law firm he works at because this is a kid's movie from the early 2000s. I miss Casey's game again. <sighs> and there's two types of dads in these movies. It's either dad number one, the sports dad forcing their kid to play a certain sport so later in the movie the kid can be like, I'm not throwing away my dream, dad. I'm throwing away yours. You're throwing away your dream. Oh my God. Or dad number two, the busy business dad who never shows up to the sports games, but ultimately saves their kid's life when they fall off of a building because he got accidentally dressed up as Turbo Man. Thanks, Turbo Man. I knew you'd save me. You can always count on me. 
<laughs> you gotta have one or the other. You gotta pick your poison, bitch. So this is where we meet Ben and his co-worker, Drew, who obviously has a crush on him. What if I cook a fabulous dinner tomorrow night for you and Casey at my place? But he's not really ready for a relationship, and here's why. She's only been here six months. Already she wants to cook for you. Drew's great. I'm just not ready. You've been saying that for two years. You know, you need to loosen up. Have some fun again. <sighs> Karen would have wanted you to move on. So yeah, Casey's mom passed away two years ago. And since then, Ben has just been like burying himself in his work in order to, you know, keep his mind off of it. We then immediately cut to Casey researching a resurrection spell on her computer in order to bring back her dead mom. Looking to bring back a lost soul? Try Hallcross Books of the Dead. Again. Girls and their microchips, man. She stumbles upon a book that is for sale at a bookstore close to her house that claims to have the ability to bring someone back to life. And let me just say, I am four minutes into this movie and I am already way more emotionally invested into these characters than I was to any character in the Bratz movie. Dude, a little girl looking up a resurrection spell on the internet to bring back her dead mom? Are you fucking kidding me, dude? That is heartbreaking. Does everything happen for a reason? Sometimes things just happen, sweetheart. Like, oh my god, dude, that's so sad. The next day, Casey is on her way to the bookstore, and this is when we find out that it's not just the dad who changed when the mom died. Apparently, Casey is totally different now, too. She used to be a girly girl who would go to the mall with her friends, but she can't do that anymore because malls are for girls with moms, I guess. So now she's like a tomboy who plays football, which is actually pretty nice when you think about it. Maybe she's doing it, like, as an homage to her mom. Because, you know, her mom also reached the end zone of her life. I'm sorry. Sorry, the refs are deliberating on whether or not that joke was funny. Here, the ruling on the field stands. Yes! Yeah, that's what I call a touchdown. Okay, let's see what Casey's old friends have to say. Did you check out the new shoes at the mall? Yeah, they're great. <laughs> they're so cool. Again, I'm not Hispanic. Is this what girls talk about? You seen the new shoes at the mall? Dude, no, I haven't actually. No. What are you talking about? You're gonna have to be more specific, dude. Because you know how the mall is the mall? Have you seen that new website on the internet? Yeah, it's the best. I love being 12. Don't look now, but here comes the loner. That's not very nice. Ever since her mom died, she's totally ignored us. Yeah, like get over it already. Casey! Yo! <laughs> what the fuck? Maybe it's a good thing she isn't friends with them anymore, dude. Oh my god, get over it already. I got over her mom dying months ago. It was taking her so long. So Casey turns down their invitation to the mall. We're going to the mall. Wanna come? No thanks. And heads over to the magic bookstore. She realizes she doesn't have enough money to buy the magic book. 63. So she just fucking steals the damn thing. The bookstore owner then finds a note from her and he is not happy. I'll never see her again. Uh, Casey, the book was only $150. Why would you owe him $8,700? Looks like you should have stolen a math book, idiot. Casey then goes home and starts to read more about the spell. Now you are ready to summon a life force. Step one, prepare the altar. <laughs> now make a wish. Hilarious reaction to prepare the altar. Sacrifice a baby goat. Oh, so now it's Casey's birthday. This is when Drew shows up and surprises Casey with a birthday gift. Hey, sweetie, happy birthday. I couldn't help myself. Oh, what do you know? A doll. This is a very special doll. An Eve doll. Let's go to the mall. So obviously, Casey doesn't really care for the gift because she fucking hates dolls. And microchips. So she tosses Eve up on a shelf above her sacrificial pentagram. Girls and their satanic rituals. And this part is pretty crazy, so I'll try my best to recap it. Casey needs to place one of her mom's hairs in the pentagram, so she grabs her old hairbrush and places it in the middle. She's then interrupted by Drew, so she hides the pentagram. Drew then starts touching shit, and then a bunch of stuff falls on top of the ritual site, including Eve. Casey then packs it all up and leaves for a moment. Drew decides to brush Eve's hair with Casey's dead mom's hairbrush, which leaves some of Eve's hair on the brush. So when Casey comes back to finish the ritual, the brush now has Eve's hair in it, so it brings Eve to life instead of Casey's mom. Casey's mom is gonna stay dead. Now, I have a few questions about this. It's not like using the brush on Eve got rid of all of her mom's hair. So shouldn't both of them come to life? Or like some fucked up combination of the two of them? Casey wakes up in the morning to find some some grotesque, macabre abomination. <laughs> A half plastic, half fleshy being 
four arms and four legs and the memories of her mom, but the face of Tyra Banks. The other thing that doesn't make sense, this is a resurrection spell. She res my erection to my spell. This spell should only bring someone back from the dead. Why the fuck did it bring Eve to life. The implications of that are terrifying. That would mean Eve is dead, which would then mean every doll used to be a living, breathing person, which would mean there's like a colony somewhere of little women and companies are stealing them and like taxidermying them also and selling them to little girls. That's fucked up, dude. And also, dude, if that's true, Greta Gerwig made two movies about little women. <laughs> But anyway, the next morning, Casey wakes up and a real-life Eve is laying beside her in her bed. Casey starts freaking out, but Eve is pretty excited about this. You can't be. I'm Eve. Casey starts reading the book a little bit more, and she finds out that the spell becomes permanent upon the setting sun of the fourth day. And then she finds out, in order to reverse any of the spells, she needs to buy volume two of the book. To reverse spells, see volume two of the Book of Awakenings. Volume two? Pretty fucked up. I didn't know upselling and capitalism existed even in witchcraft. I'm so dead now. If Dad finds out what happened, he'll really send me back to that shrink. Um, considering your current problem, <laughs> I think a shrink is exactly what you need. <laughs> Sorry. They head over to the bookstore to get volume two, and Eve is freaking out about everything because she's never seen any of this real life shit. She's a doll. I can smell! They end up getting chased by the bookstore owner, and Casey almost gets hit by a truck. But Eve saves her life by serving face to the driver. Ben sees all of this go down, and he thanks Eve for saving Casey's life. I'm Ben Stewart. Are all the men here as handsome as you are? Oh. Okay, so I gotta talk about this really quick because this movie uses a trope that I learned about from a pop culture detective video essay a couple of years ago. And now I see the trope like very frequently and it creeps me out every time. And this trope is called Born Sexy Yesterday. And it is insane how frequent it appears in movies. The video essay explains it much better than I will, but it's usually a trope that exists in like sci-fi films. Basically when there's an attractive adult woman character who is either a robot or an alien or some other foreign sentient being who was either created or or shipwrecked or transported from another world. So this adult woman is experiencing our world in an innocent, naive, childlike way while also being a fully grown woman who is often hypersexualized. And the trope appeals to men, obviously, like everything else, because <laughs> if you're like a shit guy and you met a beautiful woman who's never met any other man before, you're automatically going to be seen as the smartest, most handsome man they've ever seen because you're the first one they've ever seen. And Life Size doesn't abuse this trope as bad as a movie like The Fifth Element does where the female character literally talks like a baby. By the big boom. Big yeah. boom. Yeah, boom. big bada boom. Bada boom. <laughs> big ba boom, big bada boom. <laughs> And then Bruce Willis is like, she's the perfect woman. Perfect. But it's still a little weird to see the trope in this film. Pretty much the best way to describe the born sexy yesterday trope is that clip of Fred Armisen in the one episode of Broad City. I'm sorry. I'm a little baby. I'm a baby. I have no money. Okay, back to the movie. They bring Eve to the mall to repay her for saving Casey's life. And then we get a classic early 2000s trying clothes on montage. <laughs> They then go get dinner when Eve starts thirsting over Ben. You are the most interesting man that I have ever met. <laughs> like I said earlier, he's the first guy she's ever met, so of course she's gonna think that way. Also, dude, in terms of one of your toys coming to life, I feel like this isn't that bad. This might be the one aspect of life where dudes would have it harder. I'm sorry. Because I was a stereotypical, like, young boy growing up, and this got me thinking, like, what would happen if one of my action figures came to life one day? Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us... <laughs> Deliver Finish it! Finish it! It would kind of be something like that. So Casey then tells her dad that Eve is a doll come to life, but obviously he doesn't believe it. Dad, Eve's really a doll. Casey... I knew you wouldn't believe me. So she decides to prove it to him. She finds out that each Eve doll has a special number printed on the bottom of their left foot 
for authentication purposes. So in her head, she's like, well, if I can show my dad the number stamped on the bottom of Eve's foot, then he'll believe me when I say that she's a doll. And let me tell you, I know exactly how that would go. Dad, you gotta believe me. Eve is a doll. She came to life. Look, Casey, I know your mom is gone and you're looking for a motherly figure right now, but this... This isn't healthy. But dad, I'm telling the truth. I won't entertain this crazy idea any longer. That's enough about Eve being a doll. But I can prove it, dad. All I have to do is show you Tyra Banks' bare feet. Okay, so Ben actually ends up hiring Eve as his receptionist. And obviously things don't go well because she doesn't know what the hell is going on. She's just a baby. So the other receptionist is super mad at her and is about to kick her out when Eve decides to give her a makeover. You've made a new woman out of me. And because of that, Eve gets to keep her job and go to the big office party that night. Eve is there with Ben's co-worker and he's totally head over heels about her. <laughs> you are wild. Yeah, she's crazy. I've never met a woman who ate food before. I'm gonna have to keep my eye on you. So halfway through the party, Eve asks Ben to dance. But surprise, surprise, she can't do that either. Relax. I don't understand. I'm the best ballroom dancer in Sunnyvale. Listen to the music. Okay, look, I can believe in a doll coming to life, but I draw the line at a white guy with rhythm. That really breaks the immersion. Anyways, they dance the friggin' house down. And then Eve slaps Ben's coworker. Whoa. But I think he deserved it. If you're staying in my house, I'd never let you out. If I could get away with it, I would kidnap you. Aww. Eve then starts singing the Eve doll theme song. Which you'd assume would be a dead giveaway to Ben, but he does not put two and two together. And then later back at the house, Ben and Eve share an intimate moment and are about to kiss when Casey catches them in the act. How could you? And this upsets Casey for obvious dead mother reasons. But it's like, get over it already. Ben tries to calm her down, but Casey doesn't want to hear any of it. Go away, I hate you. And look, no matter what's going on, that is no way to talk to your father. I think Eve has got to step in and give Casey a good talking to. I have never in my life yelled at a girl like this. I was rooting for you. We were all rooting for you. How dare you? Learn something from this. You roll in your eyes and you act like this because you've heard it all before. You have no idea what I've been through. But I'm not a victim. I grow from it and I learn. Go away. Some more pointless shit happens in the movie, so we'll skip ahead a little bit. Eve shows up to Casey's football practice and they share a nice moment together. So it's cool that they're bonding now. Meet me back at the house, okay? I'm just thinking now, this movie would have been like way cooler if like Casey's football came to life. Wow, what should I do today, football? Kill me! The last little bit of this movie shows Casey and Eve becoming really close. But there's a problem. Casey finds out that volume two of the spell book arrived at the bookstore. Holocaust book of the dead volume two has arrived and eve also makes a shocking discovery eve's performance has continued to slide company officials have begun the process of pulling back the line a decision on whether to cancel the doll will come in two weeks they can't yeah losing a parent is heartbreaking okay but i can speak from experience it is nothing compared to to a flop era. Casey tells Eve that it's the fourth day of the spell, but she doesn't want to reverse it anymore because she loves Eve now. Today's the fourth day. By sunset, the spell will become permanent. Permanent? Yeah, you'll never have to be a doll again. It's official. But that complicates things because now Eve wants to reverse the spell so she can go back to Sunnyvale and make sure Eve dolls aren't discontinued. But Casey, I just saw on the TV they're about to catch There's my ride. Up. Gotta go. Back at Ben's office, he's at a super important meeting that will give him this big promotion that he's been working towards for years. Like he does something crazy. I'm going to a football game. How's Casey gonna win without her biggest fan? And this confuses the hell out of his boss. Ben, I've already lost someone very close to me. And I'm not about to let that happen again. Oh my God, get oh over my it already. So Ben finally shows up to one of Casey's games and immediately gets her tackled. Go Casey! And Casey is all happy about this, but if I was her, I'd be so fucking mad, dude. First off, you distract me so I get tackled, dick. And also, you spent the last two years skipping all of my games in order to get a big promotion. And then the last minute when it actually matters, you just fucking, oh, now you bail? Now it's okay to come to my games? So all of the, the last two years were for nothing? Dick. 
You couldn't have been at all my games, you know? Fuck you, dad. Sorry, I digress. That The last fuck you, dad, might have been me projecting. Unfortunately, Casey's team loses. What happened? They lost. But at least her dad is there to comfort her this time. I'm so sorry I haven't been there for you. I can just hurt. used to do together, you, your mom and I. The fuck? <laughs> she would be so proud of you. The hell, man? I miss her so much. Fuck this movie, bro. This has never happened before. Mm. Okay, damn it. Let's finish this movie, okay? Casey and Ben walk off the field and get some bad news about Eve. Where's Eve? Oh, you mean that nice-looking woman? She just left. She asked me to tell you goodbye. What? Yeah, she said she found a book, got someone to read it to her, and she's headed home. Yeah. Eve is going back to Sunnyvale. So they head to the toy manufacturer's head office to stop Eve before she leaves forever. And this part's kind of annoying because Ben is like walking through the halls and sees posters of the Eve doll. And now he's finally like, oh, wait a second. Eve kind of looks like Eve. But luckily they catch Eve before she leaves and they convince her to stay. We made it in time. It's not too late. Casey, it is. The spell's complete. <laughs> Yeah, just kidding. Eve is leaving. It's not possible, right? You can't really be it. Okay, I added in that boing sound, but come on, Tyra. For free? So there's a really nice speech here about Eve incorporating everything she's learned from Casey and bringing it back to the doll world. And then she sadly turns back into a doll. Pussy, what a pussy for crying. And I'm glad they did it this way, like a, you know, like a magic spell sort of way instead of like a realistic transformation into a doll. I can imagine being shrunken down into a plastic doll is like excruciating. <laughs> this would be a lot more traumatic for Casey and Ben if it went down like that. Bye, Eve. We'll miss you. Goodbye. Oh, this feels kind of funny. Oh, ow. 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 Ow, I've never felt a pain like this before! No, Why'd you let me do this? Ow! No, I don't want to be a doll anymore! Ow! I was rooting for you! We were all rooting for you! How dare you! But anyway, the movie ends with Eve dolls becoming super popular again. Ben gets his promotion and is now dating Drew. And Casey is friends with her mean old buddies again. And they run off into the sunset to look at the new shoes at the mall. We have so much to tell you. Be a star. Shine bright, shine far. Be a star. Okay, that's my new favorite movie, I think. Fuck. Damn it. Well, as cheesy and like painfully early 2000s this movie was. I genuinely loved it. I did not expect this at all. I waited to watch the Greta Gerwig Barbie movie until I started filming this. I just watched it like a couple days ago. I think I like Life Size way more than the live action Barbie movie. You know what? I think I give Life Size a nine out of 10. All right, well, I guess that means this Barbie vs. Bratz trilogy can finally come to an end because we have a definitive winner. After two and a half years, six movies, thousands of balls oh. sound effects, millions of Ew. Ew sound effects, and one horny weasel later, uh. the winner of the Barbie vs. Bratz trilogy is... Bratz, okay? Yeah, fuck it, dude. It is my channel. My rules. Bratz wins solely because they never had Kelly in their fucking movies, okay? <laughs> fuck you, Kelly, you ugly freak. All right, thank you so much for watching this video and the other two if you've seen them. This was These videos are always so much fun to make, and as sad as it is to see it come to an end, maybe we can start a new rivalry. Maybe leave a comment. Let me know if there's some similar type of types of movies that, are, that I could pit against each other. Also, press the like button, man. Maybe I'll get the number of likes, the exact number of likes tattooed on the bottom of my foot.
Sorry. Also, press the subscribe button, okay? Because if you don't know, as soon as you press the subscribe button, you become a valued citizen of Curtis Town. If you don't know, Curtis Town is the best place to live in the world, and I'm the mayor, so you have to be nice to me. It's the law. You can check the description for all the other stuff I do. My weekly podcast called Very Really Good. My comedy special, Keep Busy, is now available to the end of the year, so go check it out. Watch it if you want. Thank you so much for the support on that. All right, that's it. I would stick around, but unfortunately, I have to go. I have detention, so see ya. Uh-huh.